Father, we just thank you today for your word, and we just thank you for this opportunity once again to gather and reflect on your word in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. So um, I want to talk about raising kids God's way. And, uh, you know, there's no shortage of uh, adults who, uh, who weren't raised the right way. And uh, certainly as a pastor, I deal with a lot of people, you know, in addiction and all sorts of dysfunction. And um, in so many instances, and I would say in the majority of instances, so many of the adult struggles are rooted in their childhood. And uh, when you talk to people, it's, it's amazing. But let, let's talk about growing kids God's way. Luke chapter 1 and verse 80. Speaking of John the Baptist, so the child grew and became strong and was in the deserts until the time of his manifestation to Israel. And um, Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And so we see here with both John the Baptist and even with Christ our Savior that there was a process of growth. And, you know, what a privilege it is for us as parents to witness the process of growth. A process, like I said, that even our Savior had to undergo. Uh, because, you know, childhood is a, a special season and the time passes so quickly. Um, you know, and if you have small kids, you need to cherish uh, those precious moments and don't sweat the small stuff. And so, you know, if they just peed on the, car, on the carpet or, you know, gave curry to your dog or set the sitting room carpet on fire, whatever, um, you know, don't worry about it. It's just a season. You know, if you're in the nappy season and you can't leave the house without four or five bags and bottles and buggies, you know, don't get stressed. It's just a season. It's not forever. This too shall pass. Um, and remind yourself uh, of that fact because realize this, it ends all too soon. Um, you know, many parents, uh, you, you know, they say, I can't wait until they sleep the night, until they walk, until they talk, until they're to toilet trained, until they're teething and tr true teething, and until they go to school. You know, be careful what you ask for because before you realize it, they're gone to college and the house is quiet and tidy, and your schedule is empty, and you would literally do anything to go back to the chaos and fun of the days that you're not complaining about. And, um, you know, at one stage, we had five children under the age of seven, and, um, and we were pastoring as well, and I was working a full-time job on top of that, and uh, it was a crazy time, but I would go back to it in a heartbeat. Um, you know, having kids is a sacred season. And sadly, no one tells you that they're just with you temporarily. Um, I remember with my first child, Ewan, who's here today, and uh, God bless you, Ewan. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just seems like yesterday I was holding this tiny little bundle with fluffy, you know, hair like a little, a little baby chicken. And, um, and, and, and here he is driving the car now, you know, and it's, it's amazing. Um, and, and so we're, we're, we're privileged to be a part of that process of growth. But I remember when he was first born, I took out a loan. Uh, we didn't have a lot at the time, but um, I took out a loan to buy two things, and um, a, a laptop and a video camera. And, um, you know, they were an investment in our future. Uh, two of the best investments I made, really, because I bought the laptop to write my sermons. Uh, I didn't have anywhere to go preach at that time, but God was giving me all these messages, and so I just started um, uh, to, to, you know, put them together, and uh, the camera was to film my kids. Um, I had no idea at that stage we'd have five, but um, uh, I, I still watch those little DVDs I took during those days, and um, it brings tears to your eyes. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, though, at that time, even when I was single, before I had kids, people would say, well, John, how many kids are you going to have? They'd ask each other. And um, I used to say four or five, and they used to laugh. They thought I was joking, but um, um, they're not laughing now. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, my, my wife's father, uh, you know, I, I come from a Catholic background, so it's, it's a small Irish family, but um, my wife is British, and uh, she came from a Protestant background. And, um, you know, kind of one or two kids. And I remember uh, by the time we had our third kid, I think it was when we were having our fourth, um, her father rang, um, her, her mother, because they were, they were separated, but she said, he, he said to her, would they not think of the environment? <laughs> it's funny, looking back. But, um, you know, being a parent 
is such a privilege. It's a high calling because we are entrusted with raising the next generation of believers. And we're handing over the baton of faith. It's such an important task. And we must not fail. Uh, Judges chapter 2 verse 10, I read it in the first session, and uh, it, it simply says, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them, which did not know the Lord, uh, nor the work that he had done for Israel. And so, again, it's so important that we, uh, you know, give the faith to the next generation because it says a generation arose which did not know the Lord. And may that never be said of us. And that's why I want to talk about growing kids God's way, not the world's way. And um, parenting is a process, an oftentimes painful process of loving, teaching, and preparing your kids, and then gradually letting go. Parenting ultimately is a process of gradually letting go of your children. However, it's much easier to let go if you've prepared your children properly. And so I'd like to outline uh, the process involved. You know, the first part, uh, the first thing we need to do is teach. Um, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, uh, speaking of Christ, our Savior, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And, um, you know, while many of us, when we read the gospels, um, you know, are inspired and blessed by all of the miracles and signs and wonders, it started, there was a pattern there of uh, teaching, preaching, healing. And so it began with healing, uh, sorry, with teaching. And again, in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, then Jesus went about all of the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You know, teaching was an integral part of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, it began with teaching and it ended with an admonition for us to do the same. When he said, go unto all, um, all authority has been given to me, go unto all the nations and um, uh, 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 go therefore make disciples of all the nations and um, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe. The NIV says, teaching them to obey. And um, that's very much part of our um, uh, calling as parents. And so uh, Jesus said to, uh, to go and do the same, which was to teach. And so it starts at home. We're called to teach our children. Um, you know, we teach them, don't touch the fire. Uh, you, you know, we, we, we teach them, um, hold my hand when you're crossing the road. Uh, you know, we teach them to chew their food, um, uh, to use their manners, um, etc. And, and so teaching is very important, but we don't just teach them about how to be good human beings and productive members of society, but also we teach them to walk in God's ways and to be a light to their generation. Um, because again, teaching them to obey. Um, because obedience is always better than sacrifice, uh, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And, and of course, it's hard to teach them to obey truth that we don't obey ourselves. And so any of us that become parents suddenly realize the spotlight is on you. And so we need to live it as well as give it. We have a sacred responsibility to teach the, children, the Christian faith to our kids. Um, and, you know, the reality is in the world we're in, um, we have great difficulty in shielding them from the lies of the enemy, seeing as, you know, many of these lies are being taught in school. I mean, you know, as a Christian, I say with, with absolute conviction, I believe evolution is a lie. Um, I believe we're made in the image of God. That shouldn't be uh, anything radical in this um, environment. Uh, you know, climate change, all of the neo-paganism that goes with it, I believe is a big fat lie. It's worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Um, and in the same way, all of the trans ideology, the gender confusion, it's a lie. We are different by design. And, you know, I believe much of it has more to do with erasing the image of God in man and denying his design than with actually educating, uh, informing, or helping uh, children. So let's be perfectly honest. You know, these ideas and ideologies aren't consistent with a Christian worldview. They never were and never will be. And anybody tries to tell you otherwise is, uh, you know, uh, misinformed or lying. And so it's important that we teach our children the truth of God's word and because ideas have uh, consequences and I think it's quite interesting right now to see feminists realizing that they have uh, created a monster um, uh, of sorts in that for years they have denied the reality of the distinctions between male and female saying it's just a gender construct and suddenly there are men who've decided to take them up on that and are invading you know women's toilets changing rooms and sport and, uh, and so we must understand that ideas have consequences and therefore we as Christian parents need to teach 
teach our children how to te think intelligently and how to hold a Christian worldview and not apologize for that. Amen? And so... Um, uh, so we must determine, uh, you know, if we are living in a, an age of widespread deception, lies, and propaganda, and I absolutely believe we are, uh, let's determine to hide God's word in our heart and the hearts of our children. Psalm 119, 11 to 16. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as on all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. So we must love and honor um, his word in our heart and in our home. And it will teach our children to do the same. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I want to read um, this uh, passage in a little bit more in the message. And it says this, Psalm 119, 105. By your words, I can see where I'm going. They throw a beam of light on my dark path. I've committed myself and I'll never turn back from living by your righteous order. Everything's falling apart on me. God, put me together again with your word. Adorn me with your finest sayings. God, teach me your holy rules. My life is as close as my own hands, but I don't forget what you have revealed. The wicked do their best to throw me off track. But I don't swerve an inch from your course. I inherited your book on living. It is mine forever. What a gift and how happy it makes me. I concentrate on doing exactly what you say. I always have and always will. And so we must concentrate on doing what God has said in his word because it's his, his gift to us. Deuteronomy 6 and 6, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Remember, we can't teach them to our children if they're not firstly in our heart. And um, it says, You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And this is how you grow kids God's way. You feed them on a good diet. As a pastor, I believe many churches have made the mistake of trying to entertain kids rather than teach them. Um, you know, fun and games from the kids' ministry all the way to teen ministry onto young adults. And consequently, the time comes when uh, they can get better entertainment in the world and they leave the church. And that's why, you know, I'm a big believer that the children's ministry has to, uh, you know, consist of more than just simply fun and games. It can't be, you know, teen ministry can't be, you know, how many marshmallows you can shove in your mouth and all of this foolishness that can kind of go on. I'm not saying it's wrong to have fun, but but I'm saying there has to be a point where you get down and you proclaim the word of God to them, where you teach them the word of God so that they have a foundation for what they're uh, going to face in the world. And I think that's important. And, um, and, and so I'm not saying, like I said, they shouldn't have fun, but there needs to be clear teaching of eternal biblical truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, John 8 and 32. 2 Timothy 4, 2 says, preach the word. It says preach the word. It doesn't say preach social justice or preach all of the, the, the woke nonsense that's going on right now in, 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 in many churches. We need to get back to teaching people the basic truths of God's word, truths that they can you know, implement in their personal lives um, on a Monday morning. And uh, so anyway, uh, and I would include adults in that as well. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. And um, so we need to have knowledge of God's Word. And, you know, Christian uh, researcher George Barna um, in the U.S. reports that in the USA, one out of two teens abandoned church during college. And um, to be fair, in my opinion, I think college simply reveals the poor foundation um, and lack of training that many kids have had. And, and, and thus, atheist uh, professors have a field day with those children. And so, is it statistically any different in Ireland? Probably not. And, um, and this is why, you know, for me as a pastor, for, for many years now, we've m made the point of, you know, we have our, our, we have our teens in two groups. We have 11 to 14 and maybe 15 to 19, something like that. But we have those two groups and they alternate. One week, the younger group is in the main service. The next week, the older group is in because we want it to be normal to them that they're in the church because too many times, let me say this, many youth ministers have made a mess 
of things because they're like a little side thing, completely peripheral to the church. And, uh, you know, the kids are never in the main service. They never hear strong preaching of God's Word. And consequently, the point comes when they're 17 or 18, they're out of there. And, and they, they've had no engagement or experience or uh, they don't relate to the church or to the main ministry. And so, you know, uh, whatever the ministry is, it has to carry the core vision of the church. And, and it has to be a part of the church. And that's, uh, anyway, that's, that's my opinion. And pe- people say, well, why would you have your younger teens, you know, in, 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 a, in a, uh, you know, a, an adult environment? Because they're getting it once they go outside the door of the church. It's coming at them hard and fast, and they need to be prepared. They need to be able to, you know, be able to give a reason for their hope, so to speak. And uh, I think that is important. And um, so, anyway, um, John 8 and verse 2. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and the people came on to him. He sat down and taught them. And so, like Jesus, let's be intentional in our teaching. Jesus was intentional in teaching the people. And remember, they were, he was living in a time when people had far less education than we have. And still, notwithstanding that, he made the point of, of teaching the people. And, um, and we need to do the same. And so if we don't teach our children to follow Christ, the world will teach them not to. And, and, and this is why many children have failed, is because they were not adequately prepared. They were never taught. And so firstly, teach. Secondly, train. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way in which he shall go. When he is old, he will not turn from it. But pastor, isn't training the same thing as teaching? Um, Not necessarily, not exactly, because if teaching is the information, then training is the application. Um, And something hasn't been fully learned until it is applied. And uh, so they haven't learned their lesson, uh, their lessons in the fullest sense until they start to apply those truths in a practical way to their lives. You know, too many times we stop at theory rather than pressing into reality. Because while teaching them uh, will help them to learn skills, training will help them to learn habits. And there's a huge difference between knowing something in your head and knowing it in your heart. And, and, and ultimately, it's your habits that define who you are, where you go, and what you will accomplish. And so habits are what you do on a daily basis. And that's why we need to not only teach, we need to train. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. You see, fathers have a key role regarding training their kids in God's way. I appreciate this isn't necessarily a particular tradition or trend we have in this nation. Um, you, you, you know, many, uh, certainly growing up in Ireland in the, in the 70s and 80s, many fathers were lost in action. It was generally normal for the father, uh, you know, to be out in the bar and raising the kids was the mother's uh, task. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's sad because there was something, you know, very, very precious that was lost. Um, uh, it, it, it may not be a tradition in this nation, but it needs to be. Kids need their father's input. And, and feminists were very wrong when they said that men were no longer a necessity. Um, you know, I was involved in prison ministry in the States for a little while, and um, I was very dear friends with people who gave their lives to that ministry. And, you know, statistically speaking, um, uh, you know, they, it's in the high 90s for men who are in prison for violent crimes that they came from fatherless homes. And that's in no way, like I said, condemning single moms. They're doing ex- what they can. Uh, but that's just, a, 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 you know, a basic statistic. And I think it's so important for the fathers, you know, to, to step up. <coughs> Jeremiah 31 and verse 29, in those days they shall say to them, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. Um, you know, in this nation we have had generational dysfunction passed from father to son, whereby I believe as Christians we need to see that generational blessing being passed from father to son in Jesus' name. And so we have an epidemic of fatherlessness and many of the social ills um, are rooted in this. You know, the training and instruction of a father is essential and irreplaceable. And, and sadly, Many men are no longer in the home, and some don't even care. I think it's a tragic indictment of where manhood um, is at in this nation, whereby a court has to come to a point to force a man to pay to support their own child. And, uh, you know, I have men say to me, oh, pastor, you know, uh, that's, that relationship is long over. Well, if, if it's your child, it's your bill. Um, it's, and, and I understand, you know, it's a two-way street. 
<coughs> things can turn ugly in a breakup, but we need to do everything we can to encourage and su- support uh, married couples to stick with it, even if it was just for the sake of their children. And, and we're not, the church has to step in by providing positive, uh, strong, Christ-like male role models for children. And so when you go on a training course, what is the usual objective? It is that you will master a skill of some kind and be able to do it for yourself. And so what I want to ask is, have we trained and equipped our kids for living in a godless secular culture and society that denies, mocks, and, and, and seeks to undermine faith, family, and God? And this is why I don't believe, you know, that there's a one-size-fit-all for, uh, you know, kids' education. There's certainly major shortcomings in our uh, current education system, no doubt. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, If I could get... Thank you so much. God bless you. (coughs) But, um, you know, we need to... We need to pray for our education system in Jesus' name because there's a lot of good people working in it. Um, But, you know, there is these global agendas that are at play and that are seeking to turn our education system into something that it was never meant to be. The way as parents, our calling is to train our children to know, love, and serve God. And so my wife and I, early on, learned to institute a policy of family first. As a pastor, I've seen many um, sincere young men out of a desire to answer the call of God um, Uh, you know, uh, put their family through grinding poverty and in many instances lose their family uh, because of a a lack of wisdom, because they're all zeal and no knowledge. And um, that's why for 18 years I worked a full-time job because, you know, I wanted my my wife to be looked after, I wanted my kids to be fed. And I think we have to use wisdom, uh, you know, in that regard. But uh, it's wonderful for us to answer the call of God, but it's so important to put family first. And in the same way, I don't buy into this kind of blind fatalism uh, that, that some believers are buying at this present time. You know, I can't get married, I can't have kids because uh, the world is ending. Well, uh, that, I, I don't agree with that. You know, it, 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 people say it's the end times, the devil's taking everything over. That's a lie. He's not taking over me and he's not taking over you. Amen? If you're bought and paid for the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, it, you know, it may be the end times. Well, what if it's not? What if Jesus doesn't come back for another 10, 50, 100, 1,000 years? Do, do we have the right to say that the Lord is coming back and therefore we can just abdicate our responsibility to be salt and to be light and to make a difference in this world? I don't believe we do. Amen? Because it's not missional thinking for us to hide away, retreat from society, hoping that Jesus comes to rescue us. We're called to occupy until he comes. Yes, night cometh when no man can work, but in the meantime, we must be about our Father's business and his business is souls. And it starts with the young souls that he has entrusted into our care. (coughs) I'm so sorry. You see, we're not called to hide from the world, but to go out and boldly change it. That's why I believe we're going to need to see Christians being elected to the doll and to the Senate. Amen. We need to see men and women being raised up. I don't know if you know, in the the Netherlands, there's been this insane agenda to... um, close thousands of farms to appease the climate gods. And um, it's not rooted in rationality um, because I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in having food to eat. Um, but uh, they, they wanted to close thousands of farms. And so these farmers decided to push back against this agenda and uh, the government weren't listening. And so they decided to organize themselves. And guess what? There was an election there a few weeks back and one of the biggest parties were elected were of those farmers. And so, you know, I, I do believe we need to see men and women like William Wilberforce, like Martin Luther King Jr., you, you know, who can go into that world and, and be a voice and make a difference. And so... <coughs> <laughs> Firstly, teach. Secondly, train. Thirdly, safeguard. And uh, uh, it may get a little intense here, but I think it's, it's something necessary. Um, God has given you a responsibility to protect and look after your child, to safeguard them. That means you have a right and a responsibility um, that when you see them with the wrong crowd, that you confront it and that you don't shirk from your God-given responsibility to safeguard your children. Um, Hebrews verse 11, chapter 11, verse 25, speaking of Moses who is called by God to bring deliverance uh, to his generation, says, uh, by faith, uh, Moses, when he was of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures uh, of sin. 
And um, verse 23, sorry. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. It's interesting that Moses took a stand in his generation, but he only took a stand because his parents took a stand before him. Samuel, uh, you know, was a man of prayer, but he was only a man of prayer and a man of principle because his mother was. And so there's this sense that, uh, you know, as parents, if we will stand in the gap, we're making a way for the next generation. And so like the parents of Moses, we must protect our children from those who wish to harm them. And in order to do that, we mustn't be unaware of the devil's devices and schemes. You know, we must exercise discernment and walk in great wisdom and, and not be afraid to confront and say no where necessary. <laughs> <coughs> because ideas have consequences just as seeds have a harvest. And we must protect the impressionable minds of our children from those who wish to confuse or indoctrinate them, and that may include well-meaning teachers. And so, as a parent, you need to join a Bible, stu- a Bible a small group or a Bible study, get into a good church, and so that you can study the Word so you can grow and uh, because you can't teach what you don't know, amen? We can't lead others where we don't go ourselves. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans are good and not for evil, to give you hope in the future. Wonderful, God has a plan, um, and those plans are good. <coughs> Same way, God has plans for your children, uh, and, and that's wonderful as well. But don't be naive, that they're not the only plans that exist. Satan also has a plan for your kid. And they're not good. And so uh, this is why we have to pray for them. And this is why we need to, have a, to limit the, the you know, amount of daily time they spend online. And, um, and you know, if, if they're in a school, we need to make it clear to our teachers that we're Christians. And therefore, we don't want our kids exposed to ideas we don't agree with. I think that's important. Um, uh, because there's all this talk about inclusion, and yet in many instances, you know, there are ideas being propagated that are uh, completely contrary to what we believe. And, and, and so uh, it, it may be necessary to speak to your principal, and I would encourage you to speak to your local elected representative, because they do listen to feedback. And, um, you know, I think it was in the, the, the news there about a, a month or so ago, a month or two, I think it was a, a Fianna Fáil a TD who mentioned that this was the number one issue in terms of uh, people contacting him, even more so than the housing crisis, which is, a, you know, a dumpster fire right now in this nation. But a, a, as bad as that is, he's getting more calls about this whole area of gender and, it, it, you know, it, it, children being taught things that people don't agree with. And so uh, uh, they do listen to feedback. And so... Um, I, I think it's important uh, to, to recognize that we have a responsibility to safeguard our children. Um, because when you have so-called intelligent people in government and positions of authority who are acting like it's normal, uh, somehow normal, to give kids untested drugs that block such a powerful um, and, and necessary developmental, 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 uh, developmental process as puberty, uh, drugs that uh, not only block puberty, but in essence castrate the child and ensure they will never be able to have children themselves. Along with removing healthy parts from their body, you better believe you need to safeguard your children from uh, the lies of the devil. And I appreciate it's politically incorrect to talk about these things, but at some stage, somebody has to say no. Somebody has to say this has to stop. And so I think, uh, we, we, you know, for our own children's sake, um, because in a generation that's no longer even, even able to define what a woman is, and I mean, it was, I think a politician this week was confronted with that question and was unable to answer it. Somebody, I, I, I just can't get my head around that. And so you, you, you better believe you need to safeguard your children from ideologues who want to confuse your children with godless and depraved ideas of gender and sexuality. And, and so regarding those who desire to teach it to children, we need to safeguard our children from them and from their ideas. And so personally, I strongly believe that uh, talking to kids about sex is the parent's sole responsibility. And, and ultimately, nobody knows your child better than you because regarding maturity, different kids mature at a different pace. And so what might be right for one child at a certain age may not be right for another. And so the parent knows best. And, and, but, but ultimately, I have a problem with a, a child of any age being told 
that they may be in the wrong body. Boy is being told, maybe you're a girl. Girl is being told, maybe you are a boy. This is evil, it's seditious, and it's certainly unbiblical as well as being unscientific. God does not make mistakes um, in the bodies he puts people into. God loves people. He loves everybody, and we love everybody. But uh, at the same time, you have to understand that if you allow this doctrine to its legitimate conclusion, it will condemn a child to a lifetime of mental and physical torment. And if you don't believe that, then tear the first page out of your Bible because it says in the beginning he made them male and female. Sex is binary. We're different by design. You're simply male or female from birth to a very chromosomal level, and nothing can, ch can change that fact. And I can't address the issue of safeguarding children and not deal with this issue. Let me read this quote from um, The Hiding Place by uh, Cory Ten Boom. And so seated next to my father in the train compartment, I suddenly asked, Father, what is sex sin? He turned to look at me as he always did when answering a question, but to my surprise, he said nothing. At last, he stood up, lifting his traveling case off the floor and set it on the floor. Will you carry, um, will you carry this bag off the train, Corey, he said. I stood up and tugged at it. It was crammed with the watches and spare parts he had purchased that morning. It's too heavy, I said. Yes, he said. And it would be a pretty poor, I would be a pretty poor father who would ask his little girl to carry such a load. It's the same way, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you're older and stronger, you can bear it. But for now, you must trust me to carry it for you. And so, like I said, I, I have parents of young, very young children who are being... Um, <coughs> this stuff is being pushed in schools, and uh, it, it, it's so in confusion, and, uh, and, and we have to, you know, use common sense and safeguard our children, because you know better than a childless politician or academic, okay? And, and you know, it's, doubt, it, it's doubtless that there's a worldwide agenda to indoctrinate kids, um, and if you can't see it, you're willfully blind. You know, the communists did it, the Nazis did it. You know, Hitler, clo he, he closed all of the uh, church youth groups. And he made uh, membership of Hitler Youth mandatory for all of the children. So even the Christian parents who didn't want their children to go didn't have a choice. Uh, a bit like the whole Pride Week, the way it's being pushed right now in the schools. And, uh, but, you know, the reality is that, uh, these children were brainwashed. And, you know, sadly, in the final days of World War II, um, you know, there was panzer divisions made up of teenagers. You know, most of the anti-gun batteries were made up of children, uh, some as young as 12 or 13 years of age. I mean, there was one gun battery, anti-gun battery, w received a direct hit. All the children were killed. The oldest child was 12 years of age. You know, in the final days, the American soldiers encountered these kids who were fighting to the death. They would not surrender. Why? They'd been brainwashed. Why? Because the, 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 the vulnerable, impressionable heart of a child is fertile ground for those who, pro, who plant seeds into them. That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way in which they shall go. When they're old, they won't turn from it. And so, Christian parents, we need to take our responsibility very seriously. And um, so, uh, fourthly, we need to support. Give me, give me three, four minutes and I'll be finished. Um, uh, firstly, we need to teach. We need, secondly, we need to train. And um, uh, thirdly, we need to safeguard. Fourthly, we need to support. Um, as I said, growing up is part of the process um, for us as parents, witnessing that miraculous process of that, you know, uh, uh, that, that baby that can't even be seen in, in, in their mother's belly for, for a, a number of months, and then it starts to, to grow. And, and, you know, Psalm 139 addresses the beauty of God, knitting us together in our mother's womb and all the days of our life being written in his book. You know, J Jeremiah chapter 1, before you were born, I knew you. And, and so w we understand that there's a, there's a process, and it's, it's a miraculous process that we are privileged to be a part of. Um, uh, but we need to offer support. And um, because parenting is really a process of gradually letting go. And, um, but we need to offer support along the way as they go through the various changes that are a part of maturing to adulthood. And, and so, you know, my wife, she, she used to never confess. People used to talk about the terrible twos. She used to say, no, it's the terrific twos. She used to declare life over them. And, and um, uh, you, know, t you know, the tween years and the teen years, they're challenging. But you know what? It's a process. And, you know, either way, as good or as bad as things might be um, right now, know this, the season will change. You know, nappies give way to Lego, to football, to girls, to college, and suddenly they're gone. Um, Daniel chapter 2.21, he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. 
You know, the seasons change, but we must be there to offer understanding and support in the various seasons they're going through. You know, particularly as they're going through puberty, um, uh, they can become grumpy and unreasonable, emotional and uncooperative, and, um, you know, only responding to you with grunts and complaints. And a part of you kind of asks, what happened to my sweet little kid? Um, but, you know, you have to love them where they're at, and, and they will come through it. And, uh, but, but like I said, love them where they're at, and maybe repent for giving your own parents such a tough time when you were a teenager. Uh, you know, support and encourage your kids because, you know, we all thrive in an environment of encouragement. You know, Deuteronomy 3.28, speaking of Joshua, but command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him for he shall go over before this people and cause them to inherit the land which they will see. And so Moses, and uh, you know, in spite of all the miracles, signs and wonders he had seen, was told, you're not going to go in, but Joshua will. But you need to encourage him. Think about, you know, maybe if Joshua hadn't received that encouragement, maybe he wouldn't have been able to take the land. Well, we need to encourage our children. You know, it's so easy to get into a rut of just speaking to your kids when you're criticizing them. You know, but we need to build them up and not tear them down. We need to find something we can encourage in our kids. Speak life over them. Give them support because it's not easy being a kid, particularly in this world we're living in. And, and part of that support structure, like I said, is being found in being a member of a good church that takes kids and teens ministry seriously because it will help to surround them with kids of their own age because, like I said, being a believer in Ireland can be a very lonely walk at times. And so, you know, bring them to church even when they're not feeling it. I, I, but, Pastor, they don't want to go. Well, call me old-fashioned, my house, my rules. Um, it, it, it's an important principle. Bring your kids along with you on this journey of faith. Because, you know, being a parent, you're there to teach them to honor God in their lives, even when they're tired or busy. And that's why, again, I would encourage you, correct your kids from a young age. Don't indulge bad behavior. It may be cute and funny. You know, my, old, my, my second child was, is Naomi, a little brown-eyed girl. She had fat little cheeks. Oh, she was so... I used to kiss, kiss those fat little cheeks every day. But, you know, she, she was quite a strong little character, you know, and sometimes she'd just, you know, as a two- or three-year-old kid, um, you, you know, sometimes she'd look at me with defiance and stamp her foot and say no. It was so cute. And, um, uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, my wife explained to me that I couldn't just let her do whatever she wanted as much you know fathers you know your daughters have a special power over you it's you just melt you just look at them and you melt you know the boys you can whack them across the head kick them up the rear end go on get out of here the girls just saw oh, you know and um but uh, it, it might be cute or funny when they're a toddler but if you establish the principle of them having their way there will be hell to pay by the time they're teenagers because they will be uh, going on a direction that's not good so start young and establish the fact you're the parent not uh, not their buddy. Amen? So love them, support them, encourage them, but establish healthy boundaries also. And so, um, uh, I'm just about finished, but like I said, t teach your kids, train your kids, safeguard your kids, uh, uh, support your kids, and lastly, send your kids. Um, they, they, they read it uh, earlier there in Luke chapter um, uh, 10 and verse 1 and 2, and I think it's, it's an amazing principle here that it says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them out two by two um, uh, to go before his face. And he said to them, the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord at harvest, he send out laborers into his harvest. You know, M Mark 16, Jesus said, go into all the world. And so uh, I appreciate this is our divine mandate as the church to go and tell all men. But it's not limited to preaching the gospel. Our end goal as parents is to send our kids to the world ready and equipped to take their place and to make their mark for God, because he's uniquely um, formed and, and called and pre-wired them to serve his purposes, to do his will. And therefore, we must be willing to let them go and pursue the call of God in their lives. Some may be called to ministry, others to the world, a business, education, media, politics, engineering, design, or simply parenthood, which I believe is the highest call of all. And so if we've done our work well, sending them will be easy and they will succeed. But if we failed in our duty, then, you know, it will be revealed the same way as Matthew 7 talks about the builder who built on sand, the, sea, the, the storms came, the winds blew, and it fell, and great was his fall. And so, um, yeah, thank you, Jesus. So I, I, I just want to pray for, for, for every one of you that, um, you know, God will enable you uh, to have the grace to do what you're called to do, to have the wisdom. We need great wisdom in these days. And um, I just pray you bless every person in Jesus' precious name. I don't know, have we got maybe t t two minutes for, for a question? Uh, 
has anybody got a question? I'm sorry for speaking so long. Um, it's a bad habit of mine. Any, any question? Comment? Yeah, please, sir. Sorry? Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a tremendous need. I, I was talking to a friend of mine, actually, he pastors a very large church in the city, and they're planning in September um, on, on starting a school. And he said, ironically, um, he, see, he feels Ireland is one of the easier places to start a Christian school. Um, but, you know, I, I, at the same time, I don't think we can be naive. It's a, it's a major undertaking. 25 years ago, I worked in a Christian school for a year. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think it's so important that we're educating kids, but this is the reality. Very many churches don't even have a building, not a mind the school, and so that's, you know, I think this is where we need to pray that God's going to raise up the infrastructure, the finance um, uh, necessary, because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm praying and I'm pushing that, 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 you know, that hopefully our government will step back from the edge. Personally, I doubt if, if they will. I think they're so blinded by... You know, there's, there's an antichrist agenda right now, and it's, it's pushing a lot of these people. They don't even understand why they're doing what they're doing. Um, the natural mind doesn't understand the things of the Spirit, but we need, I do believe we need to see um, strong churches and Christian schools being raised up um, around the nation. But, you know, that's realistically going to be a medium-term plan. Um, it's probably going to be necessary, I think, unless things change uh, in the meantime. Uh, 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 but uh, certainly I would say p pray into that because, you know, we need to see church, beautiful church buildings like this, uh, you know, that can double up as Christian schools during the week. But it is a big commitment. There's a lot of work involved. And uh, so, yeah, please. Yes. Sure. Look, we love everybody, and, and uh, this is the challenge we're facing is that, you know, many, many parents out of a fear of, you know, the, 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 the S word, and there is an epidemic of, of that in this nation for many years, um, uh, but, but the problem is, is the, the challenge is, you know, I cannot in all good conscience um, uh, lie to you to, 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 to keep you happy, and, 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 and yet... I understand that there's vulnerable children, um, uh, you know, in that situation. Um, uh, certainly, uh, for me, with my children, uh, y y my wife and myself have always been quite picky and discerning about who we allow our children to be with because we recognize, y you know, that you, in a way, you become like those you're with. And so um, we have to love everybody wh where they are. But um, at the same time, I can't deny biological reality um, you know, wanting to doesn't change reality. I, I think it's important to understand that, you know, and, and so um, it, it, it's probably something you need to, to pray about for, for wisdom. Uh, I, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, I had people telling me, oh, you need to, uh, you know, allow people in who are doing whatever. And, you know, I've had people say, well, you need to, you know, w w would you let this church be a safe place for, for you know, pedophiles who've come out of prison? I said, no, it's, it's never going to be. I've seen the damage that does. And, uh, and in the same way, uh, as a pastor, there's hundreds of little kids in my church. Um, I, I don't believe it's healthy for little children to see a grown man walking around dressed as a woman. Take that as uh, whatever way you want it. But, um, uh, you know, I, I believe we have a responsibility to safeguard um, uh, uh, children. In the same way, as, as a parent, y you may have to make some difficult choices. Um, and, you know, parenting isn't a, it, it, it's not a popularity contest. You have a responsibility before God to protect those children. The Bible refers to in the book of Sam as, as olive trees. And, and the thing about a, a little sapling or a little plant, it has to be protected. And, um, and if you don't protect it, it can be uh, uh, broken or, or, or damaged. And, and um, you know, the reality is out of a, a sincere desire to avoid offending people, we can end up um, uh, having our children, uh, uh, you know, harmed or damaged in some way um, uh, by exposing them to ideas or to individuals that are uh, going in the wrong direction. And look, I'm a Christian without apology. And, and so, therefore, that's my, my first responsibility is to God. And, um, you know, people may like me, people may hate me, so be it. I, I'm not going to spend my life obsessing over what people think about me. Um, I want to take my responsibilities um, seriously, and I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, when this is all over. 